All right. We're off and ready. Okay. We need to pump this. We need to pump this energy up. I think. Should I go eat a Mars bar? Go eat a Mars bar and do some Ultimate Warrior press ups. I just. <laughs> I don't think Ultimate Warrior press-ups would get me in the mood. I think that would probably make me more sleepy. Why? <laughs> that man's continually... He's, he, he secretes cocaine. I watched a YouTube video about him the other day, actually. No, no, I didn't. All Take right. Back. <laughs> you, want, you want to start this thing again? <laughs> it was a video about Macho Man. Wrong person. Well, before we start, how about us predicting that the last time we did this, Money and Bank match... It's going to be both at the same time, men's and women's. With, yeah, we got that right. And not only that, but I will bet you right here, $5 on a nunchuck, that Otis is going to get to the top of the ladder, uh, look at both briefcases, and take down the woman's and give it to Mandy Rose. You think? That's happening. Uh, they've already I, ruined one woman's money in the bank. Can you imagine they, them doing it a second time? Yeah, they're just going to do a James Ellsworth again. Oh. And then Mandy Rhodes to say, oh, thank you. And then in a month's time, she'll leave him. She's not in the match, is she? Who did she lose to? Carmella. She lost to Carmella. Yeah. Which just further furthers my idea that Otis will be picking up the women's money in the bank briefcase for Mandy. Someone's falling off the tower. I heard that Vince McMahon taught Becky Lynch how to fall off a tower. Yeah, so, so that means someone is definitely doing it. And Becky Lynch is Hollywood now. You, you heard about this? Yeah, she's going to be. Making movies. She's going. What? Well, she's in billions, and she's in talks with Marvel. Oh, with Marvel, is it? Yeah. Uh, John Cena and The Rock have given given her acting advice uh, to move on and become a part timer. So, what's she doing in Marvel? Is she gonna be a superhero? I think of some some form. They haven't talked about what film it actually is. Uh, something in Phase Three. You're a nerd, so you'd probably so that, figure out. That means she films. might be in a. That means she might actually be in a TV show for. Um, Disney Plus or whatever it's called. Are they doing original Marvels now? Yeah, instead of making movies, they're going to more focus on TV shows for their streaming service. Do you have Disney Plus? Uh, we did a trial of it. Did you watch The Mandalorian? Uh, yes, I watched some of it. I did. It was good. Any good? It was good, actually. It was very different, like, style. The style of those movies, even the new ones. I've never been particularly been a massive Disney fan, and I don't really want to watch 25 years of The Simpsons. So. I I watch so many episodes of The Simpsons. It's good lockdown binge worthy material, just, I guess. Yeah, it's just so easy to watch one after another because without adverts, it's like about 20 minutes long, 25 ish minutes. So you just crack through them. Well, Ben, if you're feeling low energy. Maybe you should do what PCO did this week. What did PCO do this week? Uh, so this was covered by the Sun newspaper, who called him a former professional wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Claims to inject himself with Tysol and thanks tr- thanks Trump in sick coronavirus stunt, is the headline. What, what basi- did he do? So basically he posted a video onto YouTube and his handler went and bought disinfectant from a gas station. And then got a needle, got the disinfectant, and uh, injected it into PCO's bloodstream, who then thanked Donald Trump and pronounced that coronavirus was dead. You then cut to a camera shot of a gravestone with coronavirus on it, and then cut three seconds later to an unrelated shot of um, PCO ingesting a liquid and then fire breathing and burning down a cross. Okay, so, so this is satire, right? Or is this, I, or I is think this... so. I think it's so deep into the wrestling carny that nobody really knows at this point whether okay. PCO is alive or dead. But the Sun were not happy about it. It sounds like this is a Mickey takeoff, Donald Trump telling people to ingest bleach. I would assume so. That, right. I think that's that's what they're going for. Um, well, as but... long as it's against and not in favour of him, then I suppose that's okay. Well, the son were just outraged that somebody would such do such a sickening and vile stunt. In I feel like maybe the son didn't. Children. I feel like the son maybe didn't understand. I feel like the son mostly doesn't understand anything. Aren't they like the number one newspaper that reports on pro wrestling in this country? 
Yeah, because they're also the number one newspaper that people that don't think properly buy. I think that, I think that says something. If our one hundred percent sums it up. <laughs> yeah, hasn't hasn't Pierre Carl Ule uh, just finished being Ring of, Honor, Ring of Honor champion? Yeah, he was Ring of Honor champion last year. I, to be honest, I haven't really been following them for a while, so I don't know. He's champion well, the, now. the Sun has painted him out as a batshit crazy retired pro wrestler from the 90s who decided to just inject himself with something and spit fire onto a cross. I mean, that does kind of sum him up. His gimmick <laughs> is to be batshit crazy. I think we should show the Sun uh, him getting rejuvenated by Thunderbolts. From yeah, I mean, his actual gimmick, his literal gimmick to is be executed every single match to be awakened as a Frankenstein. I think he's great. I love it. I love it, but he, I don't think he should be Ring of Honor champion. It doesn't really fit the legitimate... I don't understand Ring of Honor at all. I have to admit, I've been watching the greatest hit compilations of their various wrestlers, and it, the whole thing seems all over the place. I thought you but, were enjoying that. No, I am. I am enjoying it, but the, the, they don't have a tone. Like The whole tone's supposed to be professionalism and... Um, like proper sporting events, isn't it? Yes, it is. But there's some crazy carny bullshit going on. But like, there is also some crazy comedy stuff in there too. It reminds me of uh, Vader's White Castle of Fear that he invited Sting to. I'm watching WCW Saturday Night from 1993 at the moment. And um, one thing I noticed from this is that WCW in the early 90s far predated stuff like the Boneyard match and the Firefly Funhouse match, they were doing this over 20 plus years ago and Vader has a white castle of fear and then two two years later Hulk Hogan went to the Dungeon of Doom. (laughs) But was it good? Well they're like um, bad Power Rangers backdrops. Okay. They probably stole off the site of a Hollywood lot. Okay. Bare budget stuff. But it's great. So carny. Actually, that's a good segue into our, our first topic. What, what, what's your thinking of these B-movie-looking mo- matches at the moment? Do you like them? I like that they've taken the initiative to get something done that's a little bit different or interesting, given the lack of crowd. I really hope that they don't stick around. Yeah, because... I think they're starting to be overused already. So, at Rebellion, we had one of these B-movie matches, but it came out of nowhere. There was no, like hype or build to it. it it just happened impact have stolen the idea have they yeah so on night one it was um sammy callaghan sammy callaghan versus ken, ken shamrock. shamrock there was no prior warning that this was going to happen and the match actually started um as a match would they came to the ring but before they could get in the ring and call the bell they just brought around ringside pretty normal whatever and then they brought to backstage area but the camera didn't follow them. The announcers were being a bit weird about it. And then it cut to a camera backstage and all of a sudden we were in a B-movie and music played and there was no announcers anymore. It was like multi-cut B-movie. Where were they? Just in the backstage area. They were brawling in the back and then they brawled into the parking lot. But, it, you know, it was the overproduced multi-cameras, lighting effects, and there was music played over it and there was now no announcers and it just made no sense in continuity of what how they started the match gold dust versus rowdy roddy piper at wrestlemania 12 in a car park that one's good boy it has got it has a car chase it's got to be good i liked that one maybe ken shamrock's just too old to wrestle now i'm assuming that's why it was done I th- i'd like to thank you for informing me about what happened in that main event because i was sort of morbidly intrigued by it but i got you told me to watch impact rebellion and I got about six minutes of the way through night one. Tommy Dreamer tried to do a kip up and <laughs> failed. And tried to do another one and failed. And then got his tag team partners to actually kip up for him. Yep. And uh, my girlfriend was looking at me. And I was looking at the screen. And I just turned it off. The opening match wasn't very good. I, I'm struggling. Honestly, to say the I'm, least. I'm struggling with these empty arena shows anyway. Uh, I struggled with Impact before it had an empty arena. So yeah. empty arena show plus Impact is not on my list of priorities right now. It was a hard watch because they've gone back to doing this thing where the announcers argue with each other all the time. 
I thought it was just uh, that little dweeb from SmackDown. And yeah, so it's him, Josh Matthews. I thought it was just himself. No, he's he was with Madison Rain. Oh, that's his wife, isn't it? Yeah, they're they're a real life couple, but kayfabe, they hate each other. Or maybe they don't. Maybe maybe they're just arguing because they're a married couple. But I think Josh Matthews should do more videos where he uh, tells the camera crew to, to give him his phone back because he needs to use it urgently. I would just like a more professional announced team. I think that's a major thing holding Impact back. Did you see this video a couple of months ago? No. Josh Matthews is being filmed talking uh, in an interview segment, hyping up a match. The footage doesn't cut away. It's not on Impact, uh, but it may, it's probably on YouTube, like extra clip. And uh, he says, I really need my phone back now. Can you please give me my phone back? And <laughs> the camera um, goes black and is given to Josh Matthews. So to all extents and purposes, they are sometimes using Josh Matthews' phone to film footage. Oh, okay. I mean, well, that makes sense. It's, it's, I mean, it's not that bad production compared to a lot of wrestling. Are you seriously defending that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they're, they're nowhere near as good as other wrestling promotions that they should be rivaling. Compared to a lot of independent wrestling, then they're, they're not that bad. What do you see as the weakest wrestling promotion right now? Out of, like, the big five or whatever. I guess they are the big five now. I would have said NWA, but actually, from what I'm hearing, they seem to be smashing it. People that like NWA say that it's really good. I think they're using their footage very wisely uh, in lockdown. They're hyping up old events and uh, 20-minute interviews for weeks and weeks and saying they're going to drop this time, this time, this time. And they, they throw it so much onto Twitter and Instagram that you actually know when it's turning up, even if you're not particularly interested in it. Yeah, I think it's just the style is so outdated it's hard for them to gain traction with a lot of fans. The actual, it's not really about the wrestling, is it? I've watched a lot more NWA than you before you gave up. And the matches themselves go two, three minutes. It's more about the sort of vibe and the style, the presentation of the thing. And I think they would do uh, uh, probably the best out of all of the wrestling promotions if they chose to do empty arena shows. Because the crowd really doesn't do much. Well, there's hardly a crowd anyway. There's only like a hundred people there. Less than that, really. Less than that. So it's because not it's, really a massive part of their product anyway. Well, because it's built like a studio, you could just pipe, easily pipe the clapping in. Nobody would notice the difference. Because yeah, Because when they have the interviews, it sounds like piped in applause anyway. Whereas Impact is definitely a style where they need a crowd. They need people chanting. Has MLW MLW doing empty house shows? No, they haven't been. But I think they're going to start to because they're running out of content. A bit like everybody else. Yeah, well, I've, I've started to lose interest in the Ring of Honor compilation pieces. But it is still a lot better than the current footage. I don't know whether you've seen this, that 205 Live is producing. I haven't watched 205 Live. I, I don't think anybody else in the world has either. The last two weeks, last week was Davari's little brother. And it's uh, basically, they pick a wrestler. They get the wrestler to name their favorite match. They play that match, and then they play the wrestler's best match. So effectively, you had the greatest hits of Devari's little brother last week, and this week you had the greatest hit of the Singh brothers. (laughs) I never knew that the Singh brothers would get their own compilation show. Wow. Um, But it really says something that uh, towards the sort of super stardom these guys that for the first half of the show sometimes three quarters of the show they have to pick another famous wrestling match that they like and then <laughs> and then they get their own match then they get on. their own match you're not it's... you're not famous enough for your whole show but uh <laughs> not only this but since they've started doing it the matches that they've apparently picked are only ever matches that they've lost the sing brothers picked a match that they lost Davari's little brother picked a match that he lost and Brian Kendrick picked a match that he lost. Is that because they're trying to be humble? I don't think they're picking. Oh, right. (laughs) But but if it's meant to be their episode, why wouldn't you put them over and show a match that they win? I guess because they're losers. Because they're they're little vanilla midgets. That's WWE booking right there, (laughs) isn't it? It makes no sense. 
Well, let's get on. Let's get on to the meat of the subject. What do you? Did you watch Raw and SmackDown this week? Yes, I did. I've watched everything this week. Everything. I yeah, I've watched everything. I watched like Rebellion. I watched everything. NXT. I think I started NXT, but I didn't finish it. So I've uh, I've added one show to my regimen this week. I actually watched AEW. Good, you the should. First time since before the last pay per view. So I've got some thoughts and opinions on that. But overall, first of all, what did you think of the week of WWE? How did you find it? It's getting tedious. WWE. I I I don't know if if it's just their lack of of the roster. They don't have enough people, but it's starting to get a bit samey now. Hasn't it always been samey though? <laughs> yeah, but at least there was like a revolving cast, whereas now we're stuck with the same people. Like I'm not against Selena's crew of Mexican beefcakes. But um, <laughs> I feel like they wouldn't have this much TV time if it wasn't for the coronavirus. I think they're also good hands, right? You've got three different guys, all of who can get a good match out of nothing. And when there's not really a storyline going on, you just shove them out. Well, I mean, at the moment, Raw is Selena. Like, she's all over. She was in, I wrote it down, but I've lost it in my notes. She was in, like, six segments this Raw. Wow. Across three matches and three segments, something like that. Can we talk about the booking of these guys? Because they're in public view almost continually. They put them, they put these guys over all three hours of the show. And the first match any of them have won in three weeks was against Apollo Crews, who they just spent two weeks building up. Yeah, Apollo Crews is out of the Money in the Bank match now, which seems silly because he was actually one of the most exciting things going into it. But what I mean, there must be some long-term booking for this. I know it's WWE, but there must be something going on. Apollo Cruz, I thought was a pretty bad good guy on Raw this week. He gave a completely unnecessary hard slap, and he just kind of acted like a dickhead because he won a match for the first time in five years. I, I thought it was too blatant and too stupid for him to carry on being a good guy. And I can the only thing I can think that comes from this is somehow taking him off TV for a couple of weeks because this is one his one big opportunity, him getting bitter over a hurt leg, joining like an MVP faction and going heel. So I can't really see anything else that they would bother doing with him, just to hype him up, take him out of the money in the bank and then just leave him on the shelf again. Yeah, it makes no sense because they really pushed him hard. I'd like to see him heel. I don't, I don't know if he could do it though because he's got such a baby face look about him. Well, he's one of those guys that I think that it's it would be stupid for any company not to snap up um, because he's athletic, he's got a good look, uh, he's got a good technical style, he's got a good high-flying style. But he's another one of these um, independent guys who was popular probably for their theme tune, turns up into WWE, doesn't get many opportunities because they don't make any for themselves. And then... Honestly, it doesn't really show much at all to me as a mainstream guy that hasn't seen his New Japan stuff or whatever. I don't really see any anything particularly special going on. Well, I love him just because he's a he's a well, he's a chunky guy that can do a backflip. That wins it for me. I know you love your chunky guys because they can do backflips. But um But you've got Keith Lee for that. True, we got Keith Lee now. He's a much better version. He's, He's all we need. He's basically Samoa Joe on steroids. Yeah. And did you not see his star making <laughs> turn in the main event available on Netflix right now? I I forgot to tell you I did watch main event this week. You watched this? I watched this and I don't know how to feel about it because I want to say it's really bad, but at the same time you got to it's a kids movie. So you I, you have to watch it through like the eyes of the intended audience. But I thought it wasn't very good. For you, a kid's movie or for, yeah, even for general a kid's, entertainment? For a kid's movie. And the fact, as soon as I went on Netflix, WWE must have known that this is this is a big advert, if you like. Because they treated it as an advert. The first oh, there, fif- are, there are posters everywhere. Yeah, the there first are, 15 uh, minutes is non-stop merchandise littered all over this house. And then they even show, they, sh- they, sh- they said they showed an episode of Raw, but it was blatantly blue ropes. It was an episode <laughs> of SmackDown they were watching on Monday night. Yeah, I remember that with the New Day. I really liked the verbiage of the bully in the school. 
he comes up to the kid and says, "Oh, you want to be a WWE superstar, do you?" Yeah, yeah. It's just I, I highly doubt that anybody would say that. You want it like you would want to be a loser wrestler. I also don't think that they would respect the fact that he wants to be a WWE superstar. They played it off as the the kid being bullied because he was never going to be a WWE superstar. Whereas I think we both know that we would get bullied because we liked wrestling. They tried to make wrestling seem cool and that everybody was into it. No, I, anyway, I, I thought the, the, the whole premise and the whole setup of the thing was a bit silly. But what about Corey Graves' star-making turn? Corey Graves and more so uh, Renee Young, sassy Renee Young, was the best thing about the movie. They were the only good thing about that film. I they think. were they were fantastic. I loved I want those two to be like that on Raw. I don't really understand. I don't really understand whether it's just because Ambrose left WWE and they had a sour taste in their mouth or what. But Renee Young doesn't really do much anymore, and I think that's a cry and shame. Because yeah. I think that she was uh, a really, really strong announcer, um, and the only person that I could really stomach apart from Corey Graves, because I find Tom Phillips or Todd Phillips, or whatever the fuck his name is, just abhorrent. It's like Michael Cole's little gremlin brother. <laughs> yeah. Can I rant about something else as well? Go for it. I'm very angry about Wesley Blake appearing on my television screen and into my life. <laughs> I like I liked these guys when I saw them in NXT. No, look, okay. Gunner. But, yeah. Jacked. Monster. Yeah. You tear your fucking limbs apart. Great. Cool dude, jobber, Wesley Blake. I don't want to. I don't want to sound really mean here, right? But he is probably the ugliest wrestler I've ever seen in my life. He's got an awful back tattoo. He's a charisma vacuum. He's completely out of shape, and he doesn't seem to have any wrestling talent. And if I'm thinking that, Vince McMahon sitting is sitting in the back thinking, "God damn it, pal." Like, uh, how, how is he getting not only TV time, but a win over Kofi Kingston? How is this happening? And why, is the, why are the Forgotten Sons on my television screen two fucking hack jobbers, as far as I can tell, as far as I can see, with Gunner, who's got a good look, a good style, who, who's not doing anything? Why is the guy that is actually the money out of that whole situation just sitting on the sidelines? But is that just because of the presentation, do you think? Or do you you just generally don't like them because in nxt they were like treated as these scary this scary gang that went around just like wiping everyone out beating people up backstage and stuff and they were pretty cool um outside of wesley blake's aesthetic which i just i i don't think belongs on it i don't want to be brutal about it but i don't think it belongs on a television screen in wwe in 2020 i think that this was a point that i wanted to raise in general wwe's booking of nxt wrestlers that come up has always been patchy yes since the pandemic i don't understand what they're doing anymore just roughly you've had in the last couple of months just before the pandemic as well riddick moss the forgotten sons bianca belair and austin theory number one if you haven't seen them on nxt do you care about any of these guys number two do you think they were introduced properly whatsoever and number three, have you even heard them speak or really know what they represent? Bianca Belair was pretty good initially, but now I think she's been forgotten about this week and last week. She was on <laughs> WWE main event this week, by the way. Right, well, that says it all. Yeah. But on her initial initial coming up with um, Street Profits, I thought that was really good. She, she was a megastar in NXT. I mean, I don't watch a lot of NXT, but I know that she was... One of the main, one of the main faces in the women division there. Well, with with Bianca Belair specifically, do you think that it was a good idea to bring her up with her husband from the Street Profits? Because as you say, she was pretty good in NXT, and everybody was really enjoying her. Um, she got a massive pop when she came out for the Royal Rumble, and she was sort of starting to mingle into the main event scene. Uh, Charlotte mentioned wanting to face her; that she was getting a, a lot of momentum. And do you do you think it's a good idea of throwing her with a tag team just because they're in a relationship together? Should she have gone her own way and gone towards a women's career? Because she seems like a 
half wrestler, half manager, half Selena Vega, half um, somewhere in the w- female mid card. And it's just not where I was expecting her to be whatsoever when she came up. Yeah, I think that's where it's been a bit vague now, because now she seems like she's just a Street Profits manager. But I think the first week she came up where they did that whole, they had a match and she had a match, and then it turned into a six-man mixed gender. I, f- I thought that was really good at bringing her up initially. Her being in the Royal Rumble, I like it when they do that, when they bring they give NXT people exposure in these types of matches, and then... Yeah, no, I'm also I'm also a fan of that. I really liked seeing Io Shirai on at the Rumble and a couple of other people. And they slow. I noticed that they slowly do it, and I think it's definitely a Triple H move because uh, there was a couple in 2019 that turned up at the Royal Rumble who are still in NXT. It's just to give you that little bit of extra awareness of who they are when they finally turn yeah, up. Yeah, it just makes sense because now when Bianca Belair comes up, you she's a recognizable face if you've never watched NXT. Um, but do you, do you agree with what they're doing with her? No, not at all. I think that first week was good, and then the second week they should have done something. They, even just a squash match or something, given her something by herself to do, because I believe she can she can she can talk pretty well as well. Yeah, so, no, she's a she's a good promo from what I've seen. And then I, she had she had this whole thing like she was involved somewhat in that whole um, Charlotte situation before WrestleMania down on NXT. There was like the three of them were going at it. Yep. And then, then she was dropped from that. So even because Charlotte seems to be the NXT champion, but her posters are still all over main roster. Her face is still all over the main roster posters and stuff. So maybe, maybe her and Bianca Belair could have had a cool feud on Raw for the NXT Championship. Do Do you think that this Bianca Belair uh, getting sent up is a thought through decision? Because it really doesn't feel like it. I doubt that it is. I, I assume it's just she's available. Much like the rest of Selena's crew, they're just available. That's why they're getting TV time. This this brings me on to the next question I have for you. What does Austin Theory's voice sound like? <laughs> I don't I don't know. Why is he decided to align himself with Andrade? I assume he's he's well. They play it off that like Selena finds all these guys. I like her character. I think she's she's good. It's the other ones that need to develop further. Selena's great. I, I, but Austin Theory turned up a week before WrestleMania and had a WrestleMania tag team match. I haven't heard the guy speak. I don't he, really know who he is or why. He doesn't need to there. speak. He's just the cannon fodder of the stable. He doesn't, he doesn't have... You have to have a semblance of a fundamental character, even if it's two-dimensional in order for anybody to care whatsoever about who you are or why you're there. I don't right? think we need to care about him. I think I think he's good as just cannon fodder of the stable, and we should concentrate on using those two to build up Andrade. Because he's, he's, he's the face of it, right? He's the one you want to push. Yeah, but the, uh, the, the, other, the other guy, the um, Angel Lothario, Garza. He's got a, a character. Yeah, he, in I get the most what you're saying. Sense. I get what you're saying because yeah, he does have a much He's, more defined character. And I wouldn't necessarily blame Austin Theory for not having any charisma or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that Angel Garza's got a presence, and Austin Theory, you could interchange with anybody else that nobody's ever seen or heard of, and nobody would notice. Because and it's not a Austin Theory's well, thought. Well, that's what happened, isn't it? He did just get interchanged. Well, yeah, but it's not his fault, is it, really? It's, it, I mean, it's the fact that they just threw a guy on and said, hey, go on out there, pal. And he had to make it... Because I can see, in his matches, I can see him trying. I can see him, like, putting the extra mile in, trying to put effort in, and trying to, like, play off to the camera because he can't play off to the crowd. But just what an awful way to debut on the main roster. What an awful time to do it. And the guy's got scraps. He's got nothing... There's nothing that he can do to show me that he's a human being. Well, no, because he, he's the one just eating the losses and getting beaten up. And I think what, he'll continue to be that way. But what is the point, then, of, of him existing? I know you say cannon fodder, but if you're not telling a story, then why are you there? Yeah, no, I get that. But I think his only existence is so that Andrade doesn't have to lose. Yeah. That's you know what else I'm pissed off about? <laughs> what? Alistair Black sitting on a fucking couch. Can you I, explain um, that to me? I don't. Just the whole of what's going on with Alistair Black right now. 
I don't what like. are they do? What? Are, yeah, no. What are they doing with him? Why are they putting him in a in a gimmick match, which is not his sort of style at all? I no, mean, he doesn't need to be in that, and he's probably not going to win it. And if he does, then it doesn't suit him anyway. They're pushing him hard, and they're doing it the wrong way. I think. But they just like they're ruining the idea of what his character presents by just putting him in WWE style segments, which don't suit him whatsoever. I've got time for MVP doing a, a little talk segment. But why why put Alistair Black on a on a couch? Why sit him on a sofa? Make him look uncomfortable as he shifts his one knee to the other. <laughs> like it was quite clear Alistair Black knew that it was really awkward and it, he didn't really understand why he was sitting there. Yeah, and he's he's too chill. He needs to be more violent. Like he like you said, like he's just coming out and chilling with MVP, but that doesn't fit his character. He no. should be going out there and just kicking everyone. If he's knocking right, him out of the ring. If he's like the new Undertaker or whatever, can you imagine the Undertaker sitting on that sofa? Can you imagine Bray Wyatt even sitting on that sofa? No. I, th- I that segment what well, I feel it would be much stronger if they did it without him. And then MVP gets more and more frustrated that people aren't coming out to his um, VIP lounge or whatever. That's a great idea. And yeah. then as he's getting angry, people are coming out and telling him to shut up. Like, you're not even in the match. What, it's none of your business. And then Alistair Black comes out last and just super, just roundhouse kicks him like a badass. That's a good out. idea. And, and just and never picks up a microphone and just walks back out looking like a badass. You know what? The, the audience would... The audience... I don't think the audience needs to see Alistair Black to know that he's in the match. They don't need to see somebody basically breaking their character apart to sit on a sofa. Because he didn't say anything. He just sat there just to remind the audience at home that he exactly. was actually in this match. So, and so you could use him in a much better way by being a badass. Yeah, I that was I really thought that was pretty weak. So who do you think's winning this thing? Um, Otis is women winning the women's. <laughs> yep. I really hope he doesn't. By the way, I hope Shayna Baszler gets it. I think Shayna Baszler needs it. Storyline that makes the most sense. She's come off a she's come off a loss, and she really hasn't done much else since. And yeah, she's I mean, definitely gone she's... down a level because Nia Jax come back, and they they think Nia Jax the the big. The big deal now. Yeah, I no, I I don't want to see that. I don't know why this is a thing. I don't think anybody does, and I don't really understand why it's happening. And she's made mistakes already in her first like two jobber matches. She dangerously hurt someone. Oh yeah, she's playing it up on Twitter as well. She's uh, laughing about the fact that she's botching. Yeah, which up. is good. That's her character. She should be using that. I, there's this whole thing about um, MJF about him using twitter at the moment during the coronavirus and everyone is like hating him on it and it's like well that's that's what he's doing he's trying to be a real heel i did really enjoy him getting a hangnail outside a, a rat's house <laughs> but what <laughs> yeah that was good but what i'm saying is like nia jack's using this is try and think about what wrestling was in the 80s if somebody did something bad they would use that in their character because they want it to be real life and they want you to hate them. So they should the bag the heel should never say sorry or or backtrack on anything, I think. I think they should use real life situations to further their character as bad guys. That's a very valid point. I think that's a very sensible point. And then when the internet's going crazy like, oh like fuck this person, like that like that's what they want. Like a you know, they're meant to be bad guys. They want you to hate them. So actually they're doing a good job. All right, stop making sense now. It's <laughs> I don't know. I just, it's 2020, man. Too we many. To, we, there's no such thing as a heel anymore because that's anti-something. And I know it's just. It's, <laughs> I find it strange how wrestling fans get angry that nobody can be a babyface or heel anymore. But then when someone does it well, they get angry that, that they're a bad person, but they're not. They're just a really good character. I think that wrestling is just also one of those things that really struggles to come to terms with the times the the continual argument that james bond should be a woman yeah there's nothing wrong with the idea of that but it's not really james it doesn't represent james bond so james bond has to completely change its identity to get with the times and i think wrestling is struggling with that as well because the the things that would usually fly and be acceptable and actually gain heat 
you know that Jim Cornette talks about oh these great times these uh, great main events all of the, these uh, terrible screw jobs they wouldn't fly in today's society yeah well the biggest example of that is when MGF stuck his middle finger up at a kid yeah uh, at a signing <laughs> and it's wrong. like yeah and it's like everyone was demanding that he apologizes for that and he was like no fuck that kid that's a good move because he wants us to hate him but this is why wrestling, I think, is in a strange stasis, because obviously WWE can't do this sort of stuff. And so they can't gain that sort of heat that they used to be able to with these sort of maneuvers. So WWE's problem, I think, is that the brand is bigger than any one person. Nobody can go be their own person. Whereas back in the 80s and 90s, anyone that was massive was their own person. Because they could jump ship, they could jump from company to company, and they had their own brand. Whereas with WWE now, the brand's bigger than anyone, so everyone has to act the way WWE want them to act, because if they went around swearing at kids, it would make WWE look bad rather than the wrestler. But AEW wrestlers can do whatever they want, because they're not so closely associated with AEW's brand. So they can swear at kids, and the heat goes on the wrestler, not the company. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also part of the parcel, why AEW feels fresh and why WWE doesn't. You've got a lot of guys on WWE who started in Florida Championship Wrestling, moved on to the Performance Center, moved on to NXT, moved on to WWE. WWE has held their hand since they started wrestling. Yeah. So they're in a way that they're very inexperienced in a sense, understanding different types of psychology maybe, um, understand different types of portrayals of character, working on their own character. And I think that stillness comes across. And I think you can tell the difference for example, between, which I, I wanted to move on to anyway, transition, did you give this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What did you rate it? I wanted to transition from this into Drew McIntyre, who, to use my previous example, looks a lot different from being on so many different indies than Roman Reigns, who has gone through the system his entire career. What do you think of Drew McIntyre at the moment? I don't, Drew McIntyre at the moment stale already. You don't like him? I don't like him as much as I did. See, I think that he, out of the lot, the crew in WWE, he's actually the most human at the moment. Oh, he's, he's the... definitely the most exciting thing going at the moment. I, th I thought you were comparing him to the old Drew McIntyre. No, no, no. I'm saying that I was saying that you can see the difference between a Drew McIntyre and a yeah, Roman Reigns. Yeah, you definitely can. You, you can see that he's been around. He's experienced different types of crowds. Uh, different types of matches, different types of companies. To me, out of a pretty shit pile of stuff that WWE are throwing at us at the moment, he's the most realistic, and therefore he's the most interesting. And I thought, personally speaking, I'm not sure how you felt about it, closing promo of Raw, great stuff. Really enjoyed that. Best thing on the show for me, and um, probably the best thing WWE did this week. Yeah, that, actually, that promo was really good. I thought it was really good on um, Seth Rollins' character as well. Yeah, I think he's really um, bounced back well and rebranded himself well uh, after whatever last year was. Yeah, his motivations now are really defined, mm. and his character now makes sense. Like, that, that, that segment really sold the match for me, and I'm actually interested in it now, whereas beforehand I did, really didn't care. Yeah, and, and I then, like the fact that they slowly built up chance of physical aggression instead of going straight into it yeah i mean it was a refreshing take on the contract signing which mm -hmm. is usually such a boring segment they did something different with it the other highlight of raw jinder mahal is uh that... jinder returning the um, Raja. yeah sure I, I, it depends what they do with him i suppose i mean i guess it's the nature of the beast that they just don't have a lot of talent at the moment but everybody's doing squash matches mm -hmm. so it's not fair, because like, Sheamus is doing the same thing on SmackDown. I guess, I guess it just depends what he does next, because at the moment he's not done anything that everybody else isn't doing. Thoughts and opinions on there being one space left in the Money in the Bank match. Jinder Mahal qualifying, winning the Money in the Bank match, going into a Jinder Drew feud. I have no problem with that. What I think should happen to try and... Um, push McIntyre to bigger than he is whoever wins money in the bank I think should lose Mac okay. like, so whether it's Baron Corbin or um, Jinder 
I, I think when they cash in, they should lose and McIntyre should retain. And then just help solidify McIntyre as a big badass, you know? That's actually a really good idea that I enjoy the Money in the Bank winner not winning and actually just building up the champion that they've got. And given given the lack of crowd and sort of what's going on right now, I think that's really needed. It's only happened like three times, so it's quite a fresh idea. That I think I, I agree with you. I think that's a, a good idea for once. Unless uh, they unless they cash in on Braun, that would make sense to get the championship out of the Wyatt storyline. Braun is one of my least favorite things at the moment, and it's incredibly disappointing because I think they could do so much with Braun and Bray given the history. And yet they've got Bray reading a book to Braun about the black sheep and talking in really bad, unfunny, unclever riddles. And I think it, for me personally, I think that's the worst thing on WWE TV right now. Actually worse than opening your SmackDown King Corbin for 15 minutes and expecting people to carry on watching. What was that about? (laughs) <laughs> I actually, you say that, but I actually enjoyed that match, the um, Daniel Bryan Corbin match. Oh well, Bryan can turn shit into gold. Yeah, can't he, that was really? the best thing on SmackDown. I actually changed my mind. I changed my pick for Money in the Ladder. Daniel Bryan should win, and then go over to SmackDown and then insert himself in the Braun Bray storyline because he's got history with both of them, and it makes he sense. He does. That's true. And then you could have this whole trippy thing of him being involved in the fun house because i don't think he's been referenced in the fun house yet has he no so but there, he's well no no he um he had it he had a match with the fiend didn't he royal rumble hey, no yeah no they have had a feud they've already had a feud oh have they? yeah because that's was... why daniel bryan cut his hair i thought it was miz at the royal rumble miz at tlc um and then brian faced the fiend at the rumble because Strat there's match. Awful segment. Yeah, I think so. There's an awful yeah. segment where Fiend came out of the ring and he just kept throwing hair out of the ring. Don't yeah, you saw that. yeah, yeah. Well, this was the strap match. Yeah, I'm mistaken. No, so maybe I'll stick with my original idea then that um, Corbin or someone wins it and then they lose it to McIntyre. You touched on a pretty valid point, though, that um, Daniel Bryan seems to be treading water a lot at the moment. He doesn't. Nothing really going on with him, and there doesn't seem to really have been anything going on with him for quite some time now. I guess that's just because, like you said, he's such a strong hand; they can just move him about to make other people look stronger. But why are they pushing Baron Corbin when they've got a Daniel Bryan? Because Corbin's their guy. You know that. He's, <laughs> he's your guy. I do. I do like a bit of Corbin, but I'm not. You... I'm not against Corbin actually. I think um, a lot like the argument we were saying earlier. If the reins were let off Corbin. And he could be an asshole. I reckon he could be a much better, better on the mic at least. I don't think Baron Corbin has got go away heat because of Baron Corbin. When you when you dress up a bad guy to look like a cartoon character and force him to relish in it, people are not going to enjoy it. Just yeah, the exactly. same way they didn't enjoy Commissioner Corbin or anything he's really been given. It's, I don't think it's the guy's fault. I think he does the best he possibly can with the material he's got. I don't think it's his fault at all. I actually like him. I just have never liked any of the gimmicks he's been stuck with. Yeah. And I think that I think it's credit to him that he makes them work to enough extent. You don't hate him for them. <laughs> yeah, he could still be saved. He's not completely ruined as of yet. He just um he needs a little bit of um Triple H love, I think. Some of his some of his old NXT. He needs to go yeah. work out at Triple H's gym. He doesn't need to work out, he just needs to be given a better script. Yeah. And then Can we I'm... move on to something I really enjoyed? AEW this week. What you enjoyed you AEW. I mostly. Mostly. That's good. I think you you would you will already know the two things that I didn't like. You didn't like the Jimmy Havoc match. Nope. Yeah, I, I can fan. I can see why you didn't like. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed it. I don't I don't really I don't like rate or get any of these guys. So Kip Savian, Jimmy Havoc, and Penelope Ford, I think. Have the exact are in the exact same situation as Zelina's crew that they've got TV time because there's no one else around. So I this is just to clarify this is the first week of AEW I've watched in a very long time. So these yeah. guys are are regulars every week are stables. Only in the last three weeks. Okay. Because before then we in storyline we had no idea that Kip Sabian and Jimmy Havoc knew each other, and then over the last three weeks or so we've been told they're roommates. 
they've been best friends since they were on the indie scene over here in England and now that now they're like pretty much a stable even though their styles don't mesh at all which I think made it for an awkward match I don't um, I don't really understand why a guy that looks like Kip Sabian is hanging around with a guy that looks like Jimmy Havoc well, in, in the first they're, place they're selling it and I think I think this is Chris Jericho's input they've sold it well it's just that they're veterans on the indie scene in the UK and they've come to America to, they've come to AEW and they're roomating together in America so that's why they're together okay but I'm a mainstream fan looking at TNT on a Wednesday night I don't know anything about these two guys yeah, I've well, never seen them on the independents I they mention it once that they're roommates I'm seeing a skinny goth and a s- nearly six foot pretty boy with a six pack and a fit girlfriend. And unfortunately, I don't mean to say this like insulting, but I think AEW, not that they don't care, they just don't accommodate for casual fans. Going into it, all of their biggest stars were indie darlings, so you already had to be a, ha- a hardcore viewer to know who these people were. Mm-hmm. And their first set of pay-per-views, they, there was a lot of things involved that was like either storylines from the Being Elite YouTube series. So if you didn't watch that, you didn't understand what was going on, which was like the biggest criticism that they cut out pretty early on. And I think similarly now, if you're not watching every week, storylines are moving so fast and relationships between people are moving so fast, you're going to lose what's going on. And I think yeah. AEW don't care about making their product so easy to watch is what wwe is is that a good business plan though no it's probably not but take this episode of dynamite for instance main event and the opening match the tnt championship tournament matches were definitely for casual people people that are tuning in because they're like oh look at these big marquee matches and all the stuff in the middle of the show was definitely for the people that are tuning in every week i appreciate that And this is always going to be what it is, which is going to turn into a casual versus uh, indie fight. But the best things on the show were Cody and Dustin. Yeah, and I wouldn't wouldn't disagree with that. And in between, for me, were not enjoyable segments. Sean Spears, why are we we still caring about him? Why are we still bothering with him? One of the issues that I have with AEW is that they push guys. It doesn't work. They say, well, we're still pushing him. We say, it's not working. I'm not buying Ty Dillinger's t-shirt. They say, well, we don't care. We're going to put him against jobbers a year later until you like him. And everybody is saying, please take him away. We're not particularly into him. And AEW says, no, we're forcing this down your throat and you're going to enjoy it. It kind of smacks a little bit of Vince. I don't know. I think there's a slight difference. AEW don't have the WWE stubbornness to just ignore that the fans are screaming CM Punk at someone, whatever, or mm-hmm. they're, they're booing the biggest face in their company. I, I, you missed it, I guess, because you haven't been watching so much, but Sean Spears was off TV for a very long time, or he was only on um, The Dark, the YouTube mm-hmm. series, and he's only really come back because of the lack of personnel down in, I think they were filming in Georgia, and now they're pushing him again. I think you're right in the way they're not freshening up people that are already stale. I guess in their minds, nothing is stale yet because they're only still what, a year old. Yeah. But they do already seem to have a system. If someone's not getting over to remove them from the main storylines and then put them into B storylines. And I think Sean Spears gimmick has subtly changed. Not huge. But he's got this whole um, gambling betting gimmick at the moment. So while they're doing these quarantine shows, he see, he's like getting involved in everybody's match as a fan. And he's put, <laughs> right, he's, so he's, he's be, becoming a gambler, like he, a yeah, he's putting, addict. Yeah, he's putting wages on every match. And cr- like the first show they did, he was betting with Chris Jericho. And then at one point he was betting with Billy Gunn. And then another time he was betting with someone else. And then also they're doing this whole story where he's trying to find a tag team partner, I guess, because when they go to live shows, they're going to make him a, a tag team guy instead of a singles wrestler. Mm-hmm. So they are making subtle changes. I think it's just um, it's just the situation everybody's in that they can't do much with what they've got at the moment. Okay. I mean, I, I understand that where you're coming from, the point that you're making. 
I just I've seen Sean Spears squash people now for close to a year. He obviously had that match with Cody where and it didn't work, so they brought brought him back again, put him back. But instead of shelving some of these guys, they seem to refuse to give them like fifty fifty wins. But like shuffle them back into the the mid card, but they still have to kind of push them and put them over when obviously they're not really getting anywhere. So I think AEW's biggest strength is also their biggest weakness is that they want everyone to be over. Yeah. Some degrees it works, and then and other times it doesn't. If but if you're getting everybody over, then nobody is looks any better than anybody else. But sometimes it but it has worked. Sometimes the biggest one is Darby Allen every match and Jungle Boy, those two have lost way more than they've won, yet they feel like credible stars because of working with Cody, Kenny and Jericho. And that's that's true, and I agree with that. Those are also two guys that I really enjoy, and I think everybody else really enjoys, and there's a massive difference to me between a Darby Allen and a Sean Spears. Sean Spears is given the same opportunity, just the same way that Scorpio Sky was, Darby Allen was, Jungle Boy was. I can see what they're doing, and I really appreciate it, where they take a guy, throw him into the main event, see how he does, and see how he does after that. But if he fails, I don't see why uh, he should be given continual opportunities and to squash jobbers and to look strong, regardless of the fact that he, something's not clicking. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I, why, I, I wonder why he didn't click because people absolutely loved him in NXT. He was a massive deal, wasn't he? When he, came in, his, when he came into WWE before they used him incorrectly. And in the Royal Rumble match when he came in at number 10 and the whole arena just lost it because uh, his gimmick was the 10 thing. Yeah. And then and then everybody when AEW came around, everybody wanted him to be released by WWE. He was like one of the number one people everyone was like he needs to be cut loose go to indies and he'll be amazing and he's not connected and i don't don't know why that is i'm trying to figure out why i don't particularly enjoy him the only thing i can really think of is that his gimmick doesn't suit him he's uh supposed to be like a heel that uses a chair and he can be a bit brutal because i remember there was this big thing about cody taking a like a horrible headshot yeah right It was like an old school attitude era, Mm -hmm. chair shot to the head that busted him open. And that's what gave us the the gimmick. But I remember seeing that. I remember thinking, why, why that guy? I don't think he's a a bad wrestler. And I don't, I think he's got a lot of talent, but I don't see him fitting into that gimmick. Really. He doesn't seem, I don't know what it is about him, but maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe he should have been debuted as a good guy. Yeah, he just doesn't seem like... I don't know, it's a weird one. It's not that I'm saying that he's not a credible threat. It doesn't suit that sort of um, steamrolling, vicious, violent character at all. I think that's the only reason I can think of as to why he just hasn't clicked. I guess so. Maybe he should have just come in as a good guy. Um, and They shouldn't have changed up his gimmick so much. He should have been something a bit more similar to what he was in NXT. Yeah. Um, I, overall, AEW, I loved the the two matches, the opening match and the main event. I think so, Lance Archer is great. So this is the TNT tournament. Championship tournament, which I also love the idea of to keep things sort of occupied. Yeah. What do you think of the What do you think of the name? I like it. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they don't change channels. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they signed an agreement not too long ago for like. Four years, was it? Something like that. But a lot of people online don't like the name. Why not? I think it's too corporate. It's too... I kind of like that, though. Like, I, I like how... Uh, I was actually going to make a point about this. It, it, not in the sense that it feels like a real sport, but I like that they market it as if to say, fake, what's fake? You know, we're taking ourselves seriously. Well, that's, I like the, that's the thing. That's their thing, right? That's what AEW trying yeah. to do. And I like the fact that they um, have a tail of the tape. And I like the fact that nobody plays up a little too much. There's The storylines always try to be realistic. And I think that having a championship named after the channel you're on is something that a normal promotion or piece of entertainment would do if it wasn't fake. Well, we haven't seen what the belt looks like yet, though. I'm imagining something rectangular. It's, it's gonna it's gonna just say TNT across it, isn't it? 
maybe they'll go ECW style. Although um, AEW's other belts actually do look really good. The championship belt looks like the old WCW championship and, belt. Obviously. And the tag team belt is really cool. And the women's belt kind of looks a little bit like um, Lucha Underground's one, where it's a little bit more tall and thin. Are there, I was going to ask this. Are there any women in AEW working the lockdown? <laughs> they just... Yeah, so that was the biggest argument about this episode and last episode, that there's no fucking women about. Yeah, they are. There's there's women working, and for some reason they just got no spotlight. So there are still women wrestlers yeah. in AEW, yeah, not they, in quarantine? They, yeah, they were there. They were at the tapings, and they're just not being used. Oh. What do you think of Britt Baker and her uh, segments? Loved that. I yeah. thought that was great. That was some really good work. And so... I, so the person in that segment that was like the the stylist or whatever, yeah. she she is I can't remember her name, like Rebel or something from TNA back when TNA was turning into Impact like a couple of years back. Rebel Hardy, something like that. No, it's it's not her. It's not Hardy's wife. It's um okay. some someone else. But I believe her name was Rebel or something like that. So there's an idea that maybe she's gonna be coming in as as a good guy and she's going to be Britt Baker's first kind of massive story as a heel. Okay. That sounds good. I, I, when I first started watching, I, I started watching with everybody else watched the first five or six weeks. I didn't get Britt Baker. I didn't understand why she was being pushed no one this did. guy. No, no one did. You, you're, we're all in I'm the same boat there. That. Okay. Um, I'm really enjoying her character from yeah, what I've seen this week. Her, her heel turn is probably the best thing to happen in AEW's women division. Mm-hmm. I um, also loved the best part of the show, the best part of the week, and the greatest commentator alive today, Chris Jericho. He's good. What a he? guy. He's great. What a guy. He is entertaining. He's playing his gimmick, but he's also bigging up everybody. He yeah. almost made me feel like Sean Spears was a big deal. Yeah, and he puts over the the good guys as well. Yeah, and he, like he uh, just Jericho comparing Jericho said, um, Darby Allen does moves with just a little bit more aggression, which is a little bit more panache. Look at the way he works the back. Look at the way he works the knees. It's like the great muter. I love that. I love that sort of style, and I love the way that he's regardless of who they are what they represent or what they are to the inner circle he's begrudgingly building everyone up um while playing his character to perfection but he still saves his character because he'll big someone up and say look at him he's doing really good but he's still a stupid idiot yeah and he's he's so carny as well because he's just like oh come on cody you you know that you want to slap that belt over him come on cody yeah, exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, he's admitted it himself. When he retires, this is definitely the spot he's going to be in. Well, I read that he also he recorded that commentary in seven hours with 24 hours notice. <laughs> you get it. He's, yeah. he's, he's smashing it. So, yeah. um, so you excited for Cody versus Lance Archer? I think watch? that it's the biggest thing that's been built up on wrestling television right now. Yeah, honestly. I mean, it's going to be a great match. The... The doubters say that neither of them, those men should hold the TNT championship. Why is that? Because people considered, well, I don't know what we consider this. It, they had, they've never really said anything, but people thought it was going to be like a mid-card belt. So they didn't want Cody to, to hold it. I think it's an interesting idea that um, it's not a mid-card belt. It's a very WWE thing to do. You get a belt for the mid-card guys to fight over so that they're stopped from outside the big ranks. Whether it's Lance Archer or Cody Rhodes, I'm interested in seeing either one win the championship, honestly. Yeah. I think if you start out with Cody, the belt already means something. Yeah, exactly. It puts the belt over... Because that's the whole thing, isn't it? It's, it's not the belt that makes the person whatever. So Cody's a good start. Cody's going to give it some prestige. And it gives um, him something to do because he can't currently hold the world championship. But I think uh, Darby Allen would have been a good pick as well. If they did go the mid card route, I think he's down the line. I think he will will have that belt within the year. Well, I heard somebody fantasy booking that Darby Allen shouldn't go for this belt and he shouldn't become stuck in a mid card vortex. He should avoid this belt and immediately continue getting the push he's getting and then go for the world title belt at some point later mm-hmm. this year because he's on that track. That was well. That's also a thing that I th- I think about Darby Allen 
winning the inaug- being the inaugural TNT champion. You said, given how corporate the, the title sounds, Darby Allen is the, the opposite, right? Exactly. So if he became the first champion of that championship, it doesn't really suit his character. If he's going to win that TNT championship, he needs to win it off somebody who represents being corporate and then sort of like destroy it and put a fucking skateboard on it or something, you know? Say, saying that, I think Lance Archer is winning. I would be perfectly happy with that as well. Uh, from what I, I've, Again, I, I haven't think... watched anything, but f- just seeing Lance Archer work with uh, Dustin Rhodes this week, I loved it. I loved yeah. the look, loved well, everything about it. He's He's only just come in. They would be halting his momentum almost immediately if he lost. Cody doesn't need it. So I think Lance Chance is winning it. Well, I'm, I look forward to the match. And I, I look forward to that really more than anything on Money in the Bank. Even the cinematic Money in the Bank. I think I'm kind of over it. I'm more into Money in the Bank now that the two matches are happening at the same time. It'd be fun. It'd but, definitely be fun. But yeah, I just for some don't... reason that, that tips the balance for me being excited for it. I just don't want to see this forever now this should keep and be stuck to a quarantine thing i don't think that's going to happen i think this is a um this is an evolving thing i think it's gonna because people already want um another one at next mania with undertaker i don't i'm not saying get rid of them forever but i don't want to see one a show yeah i that's that's the thing that's creeping on at the moment every big show is having at least one um keeping it to like one every now and then right well i know that you've avoided this so far and I know that you've purposely avoided it so far because I know that you don't want to talk about it. Defend. Defend Marco Stunt versus the Exalted One, Brody Lee. Um, I love AEW. I love Cody Rhodes. I love everything about the show. And then it just goes off a fucking cliff. <laughs> I think it was because my quarantine brain, I'm not even sure if I can remember. Like uh-huh. Four weeks ago, Marco Stunt was in a match with with Brody Lee, right? I think this was a rematch. He did get squashed. And then every time Brody Lee came out, he was like, you know, in the audience front row doing that thing. And he kept on like squaring up. And then Jericho kept taking the piss. It's like, you're tiny. Stop squaring up to the big guys. Because so I think he squared up to Lance Archer as well. And then Lance Archer just pushed him away with one finger. I, I think the whole thing is that he he has like a bigger spirit than his size. I and they're, tr- they're trying to play on that i can't i can't remember how how it came about but i think he was he, was, he just kept squaring up to Brody lee and Brody lee kept on like laughing at him so well, that's what the, i mean that's you, <laughs> you've got uh your new guy your new leader of a stable much anticipated debut a month maybe a month ago everybody's looking forward to it from what i can tell he's not being booked to be a comedy act is he no Brody Lee? No. Four weeks after his debut, you put him in the ring for three minutes and 20 seconds. You make him sell for Marco Stunt. This is that thing again where they're trying to get everyone over at the same time. It's made Brody Lee look like an idiot. I, don't, whole... care, I don't care whether he jobbed Marco Stunt out. When I saw Brody Lee hold his face because Marco Stunt had kicked him, that he was done for me. And yeah. Jim Cornette, I know, I, I know you don't like Jim Cornette, or you don't particularly like listening to him. Did you hear his thoughts on this match? No. So he said that he can guarantee what is happening in WWE right now, because he knows Vince McMahon very well. Bruce Pritchard will have shown Vince McMahon this video of Luke Harper facing, in Jim Cornette's words, a midget. Vince will laugh. And then he'll keep laughing and then he'll start horse laughing and then he'll start crying laughing. And the next day he just put out a notice saying, hey, if you want to go to AEW, be my guest. I will fire anyone that wants to be fired to go to that company. Well, that's because, happening anyway. Anyone well, who wants to leave can leave. Right. And Jim Cornette assumes that this is because he's seen Brody Lee versus Marco Stunt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a strange one. The whole Brody Lee debut has just not gone well at all. Is it, do you reckon it's because they put him with the Dark Order? I think so. I don't think he should have been part of that. I think he should have been his own man. I think he should. I think he should have got the spot that Lance Archer got. Not that I don't like what Lance Archer's doing. I think he's amazing and really hot and 
that storyline is awesome. In a perfect world, that's where Brody Lee should have been. Uh, so as a guy that's a casual fan that's just tuned in for one week, all I've seen of Brody Lee is facing four foot something Marco Stunt and selling for him. Yeah. Is Brody Lee on a program right now? What's he doing? Uh, what he's meant to be, he's doing these like these segments with the Dark Order, like building his army and stuff. And it's just, it's just not going anywhere. And he's all, all of them. Have you seen them? They're like piss takes of Vince McMahon. I s- uh, saw him getting upset because somebody sneezed or something. Yeah, and then there's another one this week or last week where he was angry that um. There was three guys, one was dressed in a suit and he gave that guy a promotion and then he told the other guys that they need to go and smarten up, otherwise they're not allowed in the building, whatever. Right, okay. So it's always Vince stereotypes, which just, I mean, that as a gimmick is kind of cool. Like, it would work, but with the Dark Order as well, which is already an established stable, and it, do, it just doesn't click, it doesn't mesh. Future pants for him? So uh, See him going anywhere? Because I see him turning into a comedy act. Yeah, he's on a fine line at the moment, being in a worse position than what he was in WWE. He needs to leave the Dark Order. AEW are not going to do that because they've only just partnered them together. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, like because it's. We need it, to, he definitely needs to get away from Marco Stunt, whatever he's doing. Because it was the biggest storyline that all diehard AEW fans disliked. Like nobody's really liked the Dark Order storyline at all, and Brody Lee is kind of. One of the biggest signings after the elite initially being involved, really coming into AEW. Can you is the bunny and the blade and the butcher part of the Dark Order? No, they've just got like a um, bad guy alliance with some people, a bit like MGF. Like he aligns with them sometimes just because they all t- hate the same person. You know. Is awesome Kong and Brandy Rhodes aligned with the Dark Order. No, Brandy Rhodes is a good guy now. She's not really in the women's division at all because her thing was weird, and um, that didn't work out. That haircutting uh, thing. Yeah, it just, it just <laughs> didn't work out, so they just dropped it. Okay, well that that's uh, no, that's a po- that's positive to hear that if something's not working, they just say fuck it and just throw it away. Yeah, she's gone back just to being like the big baby face, cheesy grin, being Cody's wife. I don't really understand why you needed a bottle of water, though. Oh, I, oh, who was I listening to? Someone was talking about this, and they were saying that it was genius booking, and I agree with them. Why? I can't, I can't remember who said it, but um, it seems silly on what happened, but actually, the whole idea that AEW is always trying to be realistic, and anything could happen, and this is a sport, it's not choreographed, that if you look at it, in that kind of skew, Cody needed a drink of water in that moment, and then it played into a spot that happened later in the match, and it just played off like reality. Like, it had to happen, and she did it because she's his wife. What was more weird about the match is that Lance Archer hit her outside the ring. Cody was, like, right there and saw it happen. Oh, and right, nothing right. No, about talking, it. Yeah, you're talking about Cody Darby, and he... Yeah, no, I saw this. Like, he kind of... Um, oh yeah, it was he throws match, her yeah. in the way almost, doesn't he? Well, yeah, he just sidesteps and he knows that she stood there. Like you can see the, from the camera's angle, you can see that he can see that she's there, and he purposely gets out of the way for her to get hit, which is like such a dick heelish yeah, move to it's do. It's really weird. Still a great match though. It uh, was. The only thing that I, the only other thing that I didn't really like was both guys using the coffin drop. Uh, kind of made it look choreographed kind of the, lost the shine for me on on the derby's cody uh coffin drop by just anybody being able to do it and getting up afterwards you know kind of lost some sheen for him i think because that move looks so brutal that you think man this guy is crazy that he just does that and then gets up for it but when cody does the exact same thing kind of loses a little bit of derby's shine i guess so but, but cody and Darby allen have quite a history already now only a, what, a year of them being working together they've already had several matches kind of makes sense i guess i'm i think that AEW is probably very rewarding for fans that tune in every week and i think that's probably a really nice alternative to the blase product of wwe but i do wonder if they need to change with the popularity that they have in a couple of years if this keeps growing 
I don't think they'll be able to do callbacks on old matches and expect people to enjoy those things. Because as with any, I think as with any piece of culture, from a, a band to a, a film that becomes a cult classic, it's originally taken by hardcores who cherish it and love it and it's their baby. But eventually, if they explode into the mainstream, everybody starts liking them. And sometimes the bands start changing the direction of their music and it puts the hardcores off. Or the Mighty Boosh changes their style in season three because they're getting a million more viewers. I think if AEW doesn't also do that, they could get in trouble and get stuck on in a sort of glass ceiling of viewership. Yeah, uh, you're definitely right. I don't think that it's something to worry about right now, uh, just as long as it's in the back of their heads. You're definitely right. I think it is as well. But it's a weird one, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's just, that's the argument with WWE, that nobody likes it because it's palatable. Mm. It's so washed between each episode. I think that's the greatest difficulty, isn't it? It's, it's retaining sense of personality while uh, being able to appeal to the masses. I, I don't know. I, th- I think they'll work something out. They've been doing a good job so far. Yeah, big up, apart from that Marco stunt debacle, big up AEW this week. I really enjoyed it. Well, the whole Brody Lee thing is, is a problem. I had um, one more comment to make about I had one more comment to make about SmackDown involving Sheamus. He faced a young athletic black wrestler who okay. served as jobber this week. Did you catch his name? No. Leon Ruff. <laughs> wearing yellow gear and that's, looking quite similar. That's actually that's actually pretty funny. Is there any need for it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, that's just completely uh, WWE antics, isn't it? But why did they pick on him specifically? I guess they because they just saw someone who they thought maybe looked a little bit like Leo Rush, so they just. Well, and I think they a lot of people didn't like him. As a lot of people that have left the company were quite liked, so there's no need to take the Mickey out of them. I thought it was a very de- de- depressingly childish move from a 74-year-old man to a 24, 25-year-old. Well, if we got it all wrong, and that's, that is legit that guy's in-ring name. Maybe. Uh, he I mean, probably it needs to like change it. Name. <laughs> he should probably change his name. But maybe, maybe that's how he makes his living on the indies, having a name so close to someone else that's famous. <laughs> Put his that name on the poster, and everyone's like, "Oh, we're gonna go see Leo Rush," and they get disappointed when this guy turns up. I really like Leo Rush, but how much money do you make pretending to be Leo Rush? I mean, if I was gonna pretend to be a wrestler, I I think I'd pick someone else. Kurt Hawkins. No, someone <laughs> someone <laughs> major. <laughs> Although, oh, actually. Bringing up Carl Hawkins, that reminds me that, um, but Bo, you know, the guy that was tagging with Bo Dallas? Curtis Axel That's has the been one. released. Yeah. He's been cut as well. So, what's yeah. going to happen with Bo Dallas? I think Bo's got a job because Bray's got a job, right? No, I mean, I mean creatively, what do, you, what do you think is next for Bo Dallas? I didn't realize that he had any creative for the last year. Well, I mean, as a tank team, they've been doing better over the last six months than they've ever been doing. In terms of like TV time, I suppose maybe not in. Were they on Raw, or are you watching like main event or some random stuff? They were on Raw a while back. Maybe they've only been on main event recently, but they were on Raw a while back, doing stuff. I do, I think that most people have forgotten about Bo Dallas. They're on. Um, I don't think they've got anything lined up for him. Do you reckon he'll go to NXT? He could definitely go back to NXT. He's uh, got a history it worked, there. It worked for Fandango and it worked for Tyler Breeze, I think. So they could do they could do that with him. I'm a big fan of Tyler Breeze. He was so wasted, so wasted, man. I I remember being really really into him when they did a documentary about him. I can't remember what it's called, but it was him coming up from NXT into the main roster, and all of the NXT roster. He was I think he was one of the first, and all of the NXT roster were treating him like the aliens from Toy Story, and one gets picked. <laughs> and everybody was really excited for him um, and it's such a shame because I really really liked him on NXT and for like the first month or so they seemed to be treating him well on Smackdown and they just sort of fell off a cliff I really liked him during the Fashion Police thing that was great that, that was, was two people yeah yeah it was Fandango as well it was two um, people that quite clearly didn't care yeah and it and it worked it was really funny yeah. And then I started following him on social media, him and like um, Xavier, our best friends. And those two are, well, everyone loves Xavier anyway. 
Um, but then when he went down to NXT, it was just I, lo- I love the guy. Big fan of his. Up, 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 down, down was mentioned on a house party quiz question last night. There was a quiz on social media, and uh, it's Xavier Woods' podcast turned up. Yeah, it's popular. It's huge. Broken into the mainstream, seems. That's quite crazy, really. Yeah, more famous for being that than Xavier Woods at this point. Well, he's never on TV anymore. I but think I, he's I, been I he's, injured for a very yeah, long time. Yeah, he's, he's injured right now, but I mean, generally, he gets more exposure on, on that web series or podcast or YouTube channel than he does on SmackDown. Well, I can't say he's ever really done much in WWE. He's, he seems to land on his feet continually. Um, I always see him as like the manager. Yeah, he doesn't really. He, even when he was, he wasn't injured. He would. He didn't really wrestle much. He was sort of the guy that egged on Biggie and Kofi. Now I know that I like New Day more than you do. do you, I got time for New Day. Do I, you want to see them split up? I was just about to ask you. When is this happening? Do, I know. Ne- I I like not for any time soon. I hope. You don't want that to happen. No, I think they're still. I think they're still really awesome. They do, I, it still I works. Love them. Sure, it still works, but it's been going five, six years now. How how much mileage can you possibly get out of it? I feel like if they break up, Kofi doesn't have m- much left. I really thought that Kofi's championship reign was going to turn into a massive monster Big E heel push. Yeah, I thought that, that, that was happening. Happened. That could have happened, and that would have been really sweet. I, when they split up, Big E will be the one that, that goes on. I think they need to pull the trigger on him before he becomes too typecast in the role he's got. I think this is such a too. It, we were really enjoying it because it was a slow build, and they're actually building this faction up for many, many years before they they got him to turn. But I think might be in danger of missing the mark soon. Yeah, I get that. But it's, when when they do split them up, I I fear the Big E will just be the same character. I really hope not. I don't think they'll change him because he works. But uh, yeah, but I think they're sitting on something special with Biggie. He's incredibly charismatic, and he is he can give, they can give him anything, any sort of script, and he'll turn it into something of interest. He generally and could I, be the next rock. Yeah, yeah, I really do believe that, um, and it's all about timing. I would not say that now is the right time to split the, the new day up. A more a more comedic version of the rock, maybe because of his mannerisms and the way he moves and dances. I would do it at WrestleMania. Next Mania. I would get Kofi back in the title picture. Rehabilitation says oh, I didn't. I don't really know uh, what I was doing. I just I got beat by Brock and decided to ignore it. I went back into the tag teams, and that was fine. But I'd re- attained like a higher level than that, and then put him back in the championship picture. Big E slowly gets pissed off that he's told that basically being in a tag team with him is a mid card. Have a really big rematch, maybe Brock Kofi at WrestleMania, and Kofi's on the verge of fucking winning. Either Brock beats him, and Big E does nothing, or Big E interferes. Maybe Brock beats Kofi, and instead of Big E picking him up like he did the year before, just knocking him. I think that if you've got the New Day splitting up, it needs to be on the biggest stage you possibly can have it. I just, I just can't see Big E as, as a bad guy. I can't see him turning because people love him too much. I think he could pull it off though, because precisely because he's made people love him so much. He would have to do something really dastardly, a bit like when the Shield broke up. I really it, think that you you could you could get that because they've built it in such a way, or not really built it in such a way, but they've accidentally built up Kofi Kingston never getting. Everybody feels pissed off about Kofi Kingston to this day and the way yeah. that he was treated. Yeah. And if he got a second chance, and Biggie messed it up for him i think that would be a pretty or, dastardly thing to do or going on on that line where the fans are still pissed off that kofi never got his rematch what if big e won the the big belt and then the fraction slowly divides because kofi's jealous it's a good idea that's also a good idea it'd be it'd be cool to see kofi bad guy actually and then xavier's in the middle trying to keep the two together and they're both they don't trust each other they lose their trust in each other because Biggie's got the belt and he wants his mates to help him, and Kofi wants the belt. I like the idea of that. And then actually. Kofi Kofi goes on to win Money in the Bank. Yeah, could happen. He's got the briefcase, and Xavier's telling them like, "Oh no, go win the World Heavyweight Championship, and then the New Day can have both big belts." Really doesn't leave Xavier 
very much though. I Xavier's my favorite. I love Xavier, but I I feel like if they were to split, he would be the odd one out anyway. Lost in the shuffle. He would be a cruiserweight guy, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think it's getting towards the time where they need to do something with Big E. Honestly, the guy is money. If he's making that much money with the New Day, then he can do he can do that alone. This this conversation upsets me. Well, I think that if they split, then it needs to be around um, one of the two saying that the New Day to them had become the minor leagues and they wanted to go into singles major leagues. I think if you want Biggie to be a heel, he has to do a massive betrayal. Otherwise, people wouldn't boo him. Yeah. And, I don't and he, ha- he has to get brutal. He has to get ruthless. And he's got the, that body type and that brooding intensity when he wants to, to be able to do that. And I think he could achieve it. But he but has to because really... he sells so much merchandise, they'll never turn him heel. But they need to turn one of them heel. They can't just be the New Day until they've got grey hair. Kofi will never turn heel. Never, ever. Maybe that's a good. Maybe it's a good, perfect time to sort of freshen him up, or give him a try. Maybe, but I think he's in that John Cena zone now, where like they'll just never turn him heel because he sells too much merchandise. Mm. So that leaves Xavier. I can see Xavier turning heel, but then Xavier isn't much for threat against Big E. He's also less less of a money feud. I think Xavier is more likely to be out of the three, the one that would be the best at being a heel. I don't think anybody would care anywhere half as much. Unless Biggie and Xavier both turn on Kofi and Xavier acts as Biggie's manager. And I think they most likely put him with Kofi. It'd make more sense because I Biggie can speak by himself. I think Kofi still struggles with that sort of thing. I think that's why his championship reign was a bit flat. Speaking of uh, fucked up pushes or pushes to be fucked up, Kane Velasquez. This was this is our big talking point. Was well, meant to be our big talking point. Meant to be. I don't think it will be. So, I just yeah, racked my, my brain struggling to find something to do with the guy. Well, he's been looking like, Kane Velasquez seems actually very difficult. Well, he's been let go now because they messed up his debut, I think. And what was interesting to me is I was excited about Kane Velasquez coming to WWE, but then your point of view, not following MMA so much, you you didn't know who the guy was, and then when he debuted, he looked like a schmuck. He was fat. He ugly. He didn't. Seem to pose. He looked threat. bad. Uh, yeah. So um, I think the biggest problem was his association with Rey Mysterio. From an MMA fan's point of view, it made no sense. And from a wrestling fan's point of view, it was like, what? Who's this guy to Rey? What's the point? I get that Kane Velasquez was brought in on the the first Fox show as like mm-hmm. a big name value, but at that time Rey Mysterio was feuding with Brock Lesnar, and then Dominic was. Was Dominic ever meant to become a wrestler? I think that was a, that was the plan at one point because the, he was a massive part of the Survivor Series match with Brock and so Ray. Is Dominic Dominic's been training as a wrestler. Yeah. So he will debut one day. Yeah, I just don't really know why they used him to such an important extent during that feud and then dropped him again. I think the ma- their big problem was they put Cain Velasquez in the Rey Mysterio storyline, where the Cain yeah. Velasquez should have been the storyline. And I think they didn't play up because WWE and UFC are friends at the moment. I think they should have used more footage, footage. of the feud between Brock Lesnar and Cain Velasquez. Uh, Brock Lesnar basically um, lost his belt to Cain Velasquez when Cain Velasquez was in his monster phase, and um, they haven't had a rematch, not in MMA anyway. I I th- I, I think you raise very valid points, and I've been trying to. Over the last week, I've thought about Cain Velasquez, to be honest with you. And I've been trying to figure out what went so wrong and why and how you would do it in the first place. And I think the hardest thing with with Cain is like the weird wrestling route he went down after MMA. Like he decided to be a Lucha Libre guy, right? And apparently yeah. he's quite talented in that. And he did, he did some work in MLW. And that's to the Western world, I think, as a Lucha Libre star harder to convey as a main event guy to a northern american audience and it's also a real contradiction of styles from a successful mma fighter to a lucha libre it's a clash of styles in the first place it is a clash but at the same time apparently he was doing really well yeah but what i'm saying what i'm saying is like it's a hard to bring him in and not make him 
the MMA guy because Lucha Libre is such a strange side avenue to this hard ass bruiser who does ground and pound like they're two completely different styles and i think that they had trouble with trying to figure out how to market kane the way that he had marketed himself in professional wrestling wasn't something that they could book against somebody like brock no but for wwe's audience they had no idea kane velasco was was training in mexico no I, the only story to tell was kane versus brock why i don't understand why they didn't give him the same rub they gave to Goldberg. Cain Velasquez came to fight Brock Lesnar. He should have beat Brock Lesnar in less than five minutes. Yeah, and if you've gone, I completely agree with you. If you've gone down the Brock Lesnar Goldberg route of those quick, fast, hard matches where they look equal, um, I think they could have done something, but it sort of ended up being a Bob Holly situation. I don't know whether you remember Brock Lesnar faced Bob Holly at Royal Rumble 2004. Because uh, Brock Lesnar had broken Bob Holly's neck a couple of months beforehand. And they built it up for months. Bob Holly was going to get his revenge on Brock. Um, and it was a weird transition of Bob Holly into the main event just for one month. Brock Lesnar beat him in like six minutes and then they never talked about it again. But Bob Holly actually lasted five more minutes than Cain Velasquez against Brock Lesnar. So, really, all that's happened is Cain Velasquez has helped build. Brock Lesnar's law. Yeah, they brought, they, they brought him in to get the win back and then fucked him off. But he could have been so much more. So we were going to rebook Cain Velasquez, right? Yeah. I st- What are the rules here? Because I, <laughs> I started from after the loss to try and re- rehabilitate him. Oh, I started from the very beginning, from the okay, debut. Okay, well, you, you, you go with yours. Well, um... Like I mentioned, I think that him being involved in Rey Mysterio's storyline is the first mistake. On the debut SmackDown on Fox, I would have had Rey Mysterio have the blow-off match with Brock Lesnar. This is the match to end their storyline in the main event spot. Before Survivor Series. Uh, was, it, was it before Survivor Series? I think, yeah, it was. Okay, well, whenever it was, it doesn't really matter. Rey Mysterio obviously loses that SmackDown main event. Brock Lesnar goes crazy, as he usually does, and then he targets Dominic again. And now Cain Velasquez walks out, doesn't say anything, just clocks Brock Lesnar. Ideally, I would try and get him to like have a six-pack or something, maybe put on a bit more muscle. <laughs> just but, put a t-shirt on the guy, man. But yeah, just put a t-shirt on if you can't. And wear like um, a sleeveless vest like The Rock does or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Look cool. Just come in, and then the announcers are going like, oh my god, it's Cain Velasquez, it's Cain Velasquez. And then the casual fans are like, who but then he destroys Brock Lesnar so at least immediately he's got that rub is like oh this guy can beat Brock Lesnar so he must be interesting then the next Smackdown this is when we have the video packages we show all the UFC stuff the announcers break down exactly who Cain Velasquez is so the casuals are like oh okay this is from Brock Lesnar's other career path yeah and this is a big thing and then you just all night you replay and replay the fact that um, Cain Vanaska has knocked him out with like four punches. Yep. And, me, and so then Heyman comes out and he like says, "Stop showing the match. It's bullshit." I don't know. Throw up something like Cain Velasquez cheated or Brock wasn't ready. Some sort of stupid thing like that. Rey Mysterio comes out to finish the storyline, thanking Cain Velasquez for sticking up for them. And then Rey Mysterio and Dominic can just have their storyline of Dominic becoming a wrestler somewhere else against. I don't know. Walks off into the sunset. Yeah, those two just have like a storyline against uh, Dolph Ziggler or something. Yeah. And then Dominic becomes a wrestler. So now it is just Cain Velasquez and Brock Lesnar. And then, so I'd have those two squaring off. I don't know, something exciting would have to happen, a catalyst of some sort. But then they would have this marquee match at Survivor Series. Give him the Goldberg rub where he wins in like two, three minutes. Absolutely surprises Brock Lesnar. And it's like history's repeated itself. Brock Lesnar doesn't have the answer, and mm-hmm. then have and then have Brock Lesnar going over at Crown Jewel. I think with the the key thing that we can both take from this is that Cain Velasquez should have won the first match. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And him being involved with Rey Mysterio, I mean, it's a heavy word to put out there, but was kind of racist because he had no affiliation with Rey Mysterio, 
just Vince paired them together because it was two Mexicans. He had it's, that's that's true, man. Like he was going for the Mexican appeal. They've got uh, their one famous uh, likable Mexican star. He probably Vince probably heard through the grapevine that Kane had been doing a bit of lucha libre or whatever, and he just decided to get a talking piece, which was Ray. In defense of that, Kane can't talk. He can't. Right? No. Does he need a manager, or do you just? Full on, make him a silent monster. For his initial run, I'd make him a silent monster. The, okay. the all, all the UFC ar- archive footage does the talking. There's n- there's no talking that needs to happen. Maybe between when he debuts and they have the pay per view match, um, Kane just has a few squash matches just to prove that he can wrestle, either against local town jobbers or the undercard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he doesn't even live in Mexico. He's quite famously f- from California. He goes to the same training camp as um, Daniel Cormier. For MMA fans, the association of Ray just made no sense. And for the casual fans, it's like being a Ray fan for a long time, never heard of this Velasquez guy. It just made no sense. It did. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think that's a, it didn't make sense to casual fans and it didn't make sense to MMA fans. Utter 100% complete total failure. Yeah, and then after Crown Jewel, you could probably put a manager on him. I don't know who on the roster already that would work but you could Paul, possibly... Paul Heyman turning face deciding that uh, Cain Velasquez I, is where the money's at he changes client because Brock Lesnar can't beat him yeah <laughs> actually that could further the storyline for another like six months and you can br- turn Brock face and Cain heel I don't think Brock could ever be face he beat the streak that's true that's I don't true. think I don't think fans would ever side with him fair enough so mine might be like really wrestle crap actually <laughs> <laughs> right, I went but... with the I went with the basis that the damage had already been done. So I, I went from the day after Okay. Um, how do you save him? Crown Jewel, what'd you do with him? Post Brock loss, have him come out on Raw the next night and completely change face, like pretending that it didn't exist, didn't happen, starts laughing around, you know, says Hey, I'm just here to have fun, to have some paychecks, I just wanna wrestle. Uh, I really love wrestling and I, I don't really care about what happened last night. I just want to have a good time. Then I'd buy some footage from the AAA shows of him being Lucha. There's a risk there because I think most of his matches in AAA, um, Cody Rhodes were in. Okay. At least three of the matches, Cody Rhodes. Well, I'd, I'd, find, I'd, find, some fo- I'd find some sort of footage. There must be something him. out there, yeah. But um, he was also wearing a mask. And it, well, that doesn't matter. Like, okay, I'd, okay. I'd find some trip. I'd find some lucha footage of him in a mask saying, "Hey, this is a completely different side to Cain Velasquez, not the one that we've been talking to you about and selling for the last couple of months." I put him with something bullshit like lucha house party, <laughs> you know, like turn him basically into a lower card comedy act for a couple of weeks. He's slowly building up that tag team until they get a tag team title opportunity. Kalisto or someone fucks something up. Kane snaps, picks him up, throws him across the other side of the ring. Shows his brute force and his MMA side. He calms down, they forgive each other, they have another couple of weeks. Kalisto fucks up again. Kane Velasquez brutally beats the shit out of him. Then he takes off his stupid mask and decides to like rampage through the entire SmackDown roster over the next couple of weeks. That's when I'd bring in a, a sort of mouthpiece of some sort to s- say on his behalf that he doesn't really know what he was doing. He's com- All of his confidence was broken after the Brock loss. He doesn't understand why he's just been fucking around in the lower card. Wins the SmackDown Championship. Going into WrestleMania... Uh, he doesn't win the SmackDown Championship. He goes into WrestleMania for a feud with Goldberg. Uh, quick one, two, three, just like the Goldberg match was at Mania anyway. Kane wins. Brock says, oh, you, you're the champion on the other brand. You're back again. You want to fucking talk to me again. They have the rematch. Kane gets the win. And I feel like you've rehabilitated him so that he can now move on to do stuff. And obviously, you can have Brock down the line getting his third win. That's know. a more interesting timeline than um, Braun being Goldberg. Yeah. Well, I didn't really know what to do with him. I didn't want to put him with Lucha House Party because I know he's a big name. But yeah. That that Crown Jewel event did so much damage to his character. I don't really see how else you could do it. I just thought something. 
the second biggest mistake in this storyline is them having their match at Crown Jewel. Well, uh, Tyson Fury was also on that card, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And Tyson Fury is a far bigger name than Cain Velasquez. Definitely to the casual audiences, anyway. Maybe that match shouldn't even have happened at Crown Jewel because it was overshadowed a little bit. It, it, you make a good point because it did feel like it was it had a two weeks fuck all build up. It just felt like it was thrown in because it was one of those matches where you kind of felt like, oh, the Saudi prince asked for it, you know? Yeah, but Tyson Fury should have been enough on that card. And then oh, definitely. Kane, it, Kane I Velasquez think could have been on a different card. Even non-mixed martial arts fans, non-boxing fans, I think one celebrity is enough. Yeah, it's just too much. Two marquee matches of two non-wrestlers. I, I agree with you. Uh, so, yeah, riff, so riffing off your idea... Everything that happened did happen, except for the Crown Jewel match on weekly TV. Cain Velasquez decides that he is a monster, and him. there's no reason for him to beat Brock. He doesn't need to beat Brock again. It's a lose-lose situation for him. So actually, he turns heel on Ray and goes crazy on Ray. And I'm just thinking about making Dominic um, make Dominic's debut we could actually have Brock Lesnar, Cain Velasquez tag against Rey Mysterio and his son. <laughs> That's interesting. That'd, uh, be, that'd be fun. I, I mean, Dominic would be crushed. You, Lesnar, I, I didn't you know. really get the Brock tag team thing. I can't really imagine Brock Lesnar in a tag team match. No, I know. But, I know. I just, but just because like, they're two MMA guys, it's just like... Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. But, but what you're saying there is actually uh, exactly where I thought they would go with it. Brock killed Kane at Crown Jewel, and Kane turns around and beats up Ray. I thought that was happening. I don't yeah. really understand why it didn't. You got to feel pretty bad for Kane Velasquez, considering he actually legitimately beat Brock Lesnar in real life. <laughs> yeah, for the UFC heavyweight championship, big it, deal. It does feel like he was duped into a contract so that Brock could get his win back and Kane could be fed to him, and then fucked off. It's a possibility, yeah. but what I've heard from Brock Lesnar, I, I doubt he would have pulled his weight to do that, but could have happened. On this day, uh, I tried. There was, so on this day... <laughs> a really bad start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried. Here we go. So uh, the 4th of May is on this day, and there were a hell of a lot of roars, impacts, all sorts going on. Okay. Uh, but none of them really looked interesting at all. I did see this very one strange clip from 1985. Dr. Dave Schultz on this day was cutting a promo against Jerry Lawler while wearing a t shirt with a Nazi symbol on it. Oh. And said that nobody will team with Jerry Lawler or be his tag team partner because he has AIDS. Where, where, where was this? What is this? This was in Mid Atlantic, I think. Wow. On their TV. I didn't know they were so edgy. He was just explaining why Jerry Lawler couldn't find a tag team partner. But I'm not really sure why. On top of the AIDS thing, I'm not really sure why he was wearing a fat Nazi symbol in the middle of his chest. It's a bit close to the edge of that gimmick, even in 1985. Well, it was, um, in, um, it was in Tennessee, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, I don't, I don't want to be horrible, but... <laughs> we'll stop you there. Uh, <laughs> I then want no, to I'm, take... not say, I'm not saying they're Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying it's an audience that um, aren't so like against it in storyline. Okay, right. They won't be as offended. I understand, you like. what, you, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'd now like to take you to London, England for WWE Insurrection 2002. Oh, my. I almost actually watched this pay-per-view like three days ago. I've been on a binge watch of pay-per-views between 2000 and uh, 02. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't watch it, but... Oh, well, well, I'm glad that you didn't, because it featured such classics as Bradshaw vs. X-Pac. Okay. S Stevie Richards vs. Booker T. Spike Dudley vs. William Regal. Oh, that sounds fun, that one, actually. I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm generally into that. You're down for that. <laughs> yeah. I love Spike Dudley, whatever he does. I love Spike Dudley, and I love William And, Regal. like, um, apparently, I read a review, one of the most boring house show-style matches of Triple H versus The Undertaker. We now was, skip ahead. That was during uh, Triple H's, like, massive rise as well. 
So it was just before he shaved his face and wore weird purple pants. It was it was when he was going between DX to being the game. Well, I think he was the game at that point, but he was, yeah, but he was finally dropping like Road Dog and stuff, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was becoming like a proper serious. Yeah, anyway. Juggalo Championship Wrestling Volume Two Part One in happened on this day in 2000. I'm aware of this company. It's Insane Clown Posse's company. Yeah. Uh, they had Abdullah the Butcher versus Rude Boy in a steel cage match in the main event. Fantastic. In a death match, they had Madman Pondo versus Fat Fuck Barrel Boy. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what happened in the match? Like, do you know, like? No, oh, I didn't go out of my way to check out the footage. Uh, Billy Bill versus Dick Nipple. Yep. And Hisaia versus Chris Hero in the Who the Fuck Are These Guys match. And that was probably like the technical masterclass of the of the show. Sure. But it was booked as who who the fuck are these guys match. Yeah, I bet they didn't use like a single weapon and like the crowd completely turned on them. <laughs> uh now we're moving forward to Impact two thousand and ten. Actually, on, on those lines, sorry to cut you off, on those lines, I watched a CZW show from November, I think it was, last November. I've never and, been able to track any of them down. And um, it is not the company it used to be at all. It was the most boring indie show. I don't know, like, there was nothing extreme about it, and there was nothing interesting about it. It was just, like, a really boring local show. Have they just sort of lost their identity then? Yeah, I mean, the logo still has barbed wire all over it, and there was one match that had some weapons, but it was like WWE hardcore with like a trash can and a tray. Mm-hmm. I, was, was... Well, I don't know, I can't remember what documentary it was, but I remember Moxley talking very fondly about CCW and like all the memories he had from, he visited one of the arenas that he used to work in. Yeah. And it had it was supposed to be like really, had it had its own personality. Yeah, I mean, it was like the next ECW, and if not more hardcore, because they were using light shoes. They were doing, like, the Japanese stuff. I remember people were getting thrown off, like, buildings or scaffolding, and now it was just, like, a load of guys I've never heard of just having a boring five-minute match. Yeah. Uh, Impact 2010, only thing of note, 10 years ago this was. That was a hard year to be a TNA fan. Right. Well, you're looking forward to this one. (laughs) Kevin Nash and Scott Hall become oh. your new TNA World Tag Team Champions. Oh, in 2010. 2010. Uh, and then we came to um, a pay-per-view, because I usually just list these off for you and have a little look into the cards. But this show looked really fun, so I actually watched it. I won't, okay. do, I won't do the whole card, just some highlights, but at Extreme Rules 2014... El Torito versus Hornswoggle in a WLC match. You ever see this? <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. Oh, it's fantastic. They get like two thirds ladders and they get tiny chairs and tiny tables and have a proper TLC match. Yeah, like and a mi- like a minis match, like a Mexican minis. Match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a tiny ring announcer table next to the big <laughs> one with. A little person pretending to be Michael Cole and a little person pretending to be Jerry Lawler. And it was actually a really good match. Very enjoyable. In Vince's mind, it was a complete joke, right? Yeah, no, 100%. But Hornswoggle had the crowd eaten out of his hands. I think it's the best thing I've ever seen Hornswoggle do. He is Um, quite good. I would highly recommend checking that out. It's nine minutes. I've seen I've seen Hornswoggle on some indie shows and he is maybe not the best wrestler, but he is quite engaging. Yeah, I, I would I would recommend that one. Okay. Um, you also had one of the worst cage matches I've ever seen in my entire life, which was John Cena versus Bray Wyatt. I, I uh, definitely have seen a worse cage match. Which one? It's the um, Dean Ambrose versus Chris Jericho. Uh, what was it called? Was that's, what the Weapon Asylum or something? Was this in WWE? Yeah, it, it was much more recent, 2014. I think I missed this one. Yeah, it was. I, it was it was the worst cage match. It was like um you know the TNA gimmick where there's weapons. All oh, lethal the lockdown. Yeah, and they have to climb up the cage to get the weapons and bring it down. They did that, but then they grabbed, they basically slowly grabbed every single weapon one by one, and then barely used any of them. WWE cage matches for the last ten plus years have been the real shits, haven't they? Yeah. 
they don't really seem to use the cage anymore. Not at all. I mean, the cage match in main event was better than most cage matches on Raw. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, just to continue with this card quickly, Evolution versus The Shield. Okay. Yeah, it was lit. It was four plus stars, legit. I who really, who was really it in Evolution? It. Um, Batista, Orton, and Triple H. Okay. They had a brief thing for a couple of months in 2014. Was Ric Flair like at ringside, or was he not there? No, he wasn't there. Okay. Um, but the yeah, they've put the shield over, and they did it well, and it was extremely surprising that this is WWE doing this stuff, and it's no wonder that. All three of them have now gone into the main event because they tr- got treated like royalty against Triple H and Batista in this in this show. That sounds like it's a really a, good match. Again, really worth checking out. And your main event is Daniel Bryan versus Kane in an Extreme Rules match, which again was really fun. And at one point, Daniel they're fighting in the back. Daniel Bryan carries Kane onto a wooden slat of a forklift, and he just drives the forklift back into the arena. He picks up the wooden slat that Kane's on, just maneuvers it up over to the over the ring ropes, and then dumps him in. <laughs> and right at the end, uh, fire and table, mate. 2014. Wow, with that and the the comedy match and the backstage stuff, it sounds like a an attitude style. It kind of felt like an attitude. Like some, the rest of the matches were forgettable, but these three matches were really really enjoyable. It and might Kane check that goes out. through the fire table might take a break from my attitude pay-per-views that i'm watching and check that out it's worth it i'm currently working my way through wcw in 1993 yeah which my girlfriend prefers 1000 percent to whatever raw and smackdown is on i don't know why you can get it but you gotta show her um tna 2006 to 2009 you reckon she'd like that, that? that's that's my favorite run of wrestling ever i think I think I missed that stuff. No, you didn't. We were watching it together. That was like the uh, main event mafia. Era. I think I came in late, though. I think I came oh. in early 2008. Oh, okay. Yeah, because 2006, you had the, the Joe versus Kurt Angle mm-hmm. stuff. Oh, no, I remember that. Yeah, and then the main event mafia stuff, which is probably one of the best eras of TNA. I really enjoyed main event mafia. It is, it's just interesting to hear her opinions on it as somebody that doesn't really actively watch or like wrestling. Um, she just I asked her why she prefers WCW 1993. And she just said, well, that because they sound like they actually want to fight each other. <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah. was it. And yet, like we sit here and talk about stuff on a podcast for two hours, but she summed it up in a sentence. Any are there any highlights from what you're watching at the moment that you'd recommend checking out? I watched for the first time yesterday the Armageddon, the this Hell in a Cell. I've never seen that. Is that where Rikishi no. falls off? Yeah, I've never seen it either. And for for some reason the other day I thought, why have I never seen that? So I, I checked it out and it was it was fantastic. Because everyone's seen the highlight of Rikishi falling off the cage mm-hmm. onto the flatbed truck, right? And then I've always thought, why is there a flatbed truck there? And there's a story running through the entire pay-per-view that Vince McMahon doesn't want these six guys, who is the top six guys in the company, to go kill themselves in this main event. Because as uh, Jerry Lorna put it, it's a billion-dollar match. There's a billion dollars worth of talent in the ring. Yeah. So Vince tries to cut the he tries to get all the fans to leave the show he tries to rally everyone to protest and walk out obviously they're not going to do that he tries to get you know his lackeys uh jerry briscoe and i forgot what the name of the other one is he tries to get yeah he tries to get them up there to cut the cage down obviously that doesn't work so then halfway through the hell in a cell match he brings a truck out and he just starts like bit by bit pulling the cage away (laughs) trying to dismantle it (laughs) <laughs> and that's why the truck is there. And storyline, it's so clever because obviously I knew the spot was coming because I've, I've seen it. But if you'd watched it live, there was a reason for the trunk to be there and you wouldn't have suspected anything. This is great. I'm, I'm going to check this out tonight. And then, um, you know, back when WWE used to have all the staging, like the cool staging. Yeah. Um, so they've got all these um, cars, mashed up cars looking like a junkyard. And then the Ro- Rikishi doesn't blade. All other guys blade. 
So you got Rocker and Austin like just doing DDTs on top of a car to each other. The Undertaker puts, I think it's Triple H through the truck window. Um, it's just carnage. It's it's what you expect from the Attitude Era. It's just absolute carnage. And Does then it go the, long? It's quite long for Hell in a Cell match. I think it's, I'll watch that tonight. It's Sounds probably good. it's probably the longest Hell in a Cell match of the the early era of those matches. It's interesting how everybody knows about that match, but apparently nobody's ever watched it. Yeah, I no, and, and the rest of the card was okay. I mean, it was a one match card. So you're watching the full shows. Yeah, I'm just putting them on while I'm doing other stuff. I'm really enjoying Saturday night, WCW Saturday night, and the various pay-per-views and stuff. But when I actually see a good match, I'll let you know. Okay. It's been over a month. <laughs> There's, uh, It's not exactly high-quality content. And you got wasn't, some... a sh- wasn't a strong era for WCW, though, was it? Well, you got some big, you got some good workers. You got, like, Ricky Steamboat in there. You got Paul Ordendorf. Um, they just seem to kind of be going through the motions because they're getting big dollar and they don't really need to put, put much work in. But I am looking forward to getting to February when I finally finish January because Ric Flair turns turns off again. Okay. When does the NWO form? Uh, 1996. Oh, ages away. I probably will never get to that. <laughs> I, was doing the, I was doing the exact same thing you were doing a couple of years back, but I didn't get very far into it. Uh, but with Raw, I wanted to watch all of the Raws throughout the Attitude Era. So I started in 94, I think. I started like one or two years before the Attitude Era kicked off. So you saw like all the debuts of the key players. How far did you get? I got I got to March. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, the only reason that I keep watching them is because my girlfriend seems to enjoy them for some reason. And uh, the highlight of the show is Cactus Jack, mate. Honestly, he's the best thing on the show right now. Been telling for years. Yeah. Mick um, Foley in the 80s and 90s was a very different guy to who he is now. I just wanted to check it out because it's before my time and I will forever be a WCW guy. So I just wanted to see some stuff that I hadn't seen before from that company. I, I believe TNA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> You You've got some more? fun facts for me. No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got half a fun fact. I, I I went down a rabbit hole of looking something up, but I um it didn't get anything that interesting. It was just that the um uh, money in the bank briefcase has been defended. Like actually, the briefcase has been put on the line four times. I don't know if that's interesting. I um, mean, it's something. <laughs> Next week. Ben, I want you to find out for me what Austin Theory sounds like. And I want to know... Sorry? I'll play a snippet of his voice for you. Yes, please. I, I, I really want to hear what he sounds like so I can put a voice to a face. I'm well, done. I'm... I, I haven't got anything else. All right. Well, I think we're done then. Okay. Well, it's been good. It's been, it's been fun. I'm going to continue down my wormhole of um, Attitude Era pay-per-views. I'm going to let my girlfriend know that I exist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not going to watch that now. I'm going to go <laughs> <laughs> I got you, bro. I just got you. in general in the week. <laughs> yeah, just... no, I'm going to carry on with my WCW 1993. Sure. All right. All right. All right, see you in a bit. See you, man. <laughs>